Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Thank you for um, coming inside on one of our rare warm nights. It's great to see all of you. And personally, it's very touching um, for me to see so many people from different parts of my life. I have family here. I have friends. I have neighbors. And I have colleagues slash friends. <laughs> so thanks so much. Um, and thank you for supporting me and Gary, our esteemed guest. And most of all, this small but mighty performing arts nonprofit, Counterpulse. I'd like to introduce you to Julie Phelps, Counterpulse's rock star, artistic, and executive director. She has been at the helm of this organization since 2014. Working at the intersection of the arts, activism, and community development, she connects the artistic works of Counterpulse to the community by coordinating events to promote the power of the arts to catalyze change in our society. Under her leadership, Counterpulse's annual budget has grown from 800,000 to 1.2 million. She was named a YBCA 100 honoree in 2017. She's a published essayist and was recently interviewed by the New York Times on her unique ability to build new sources of philanthropy in the tech sector. Between 2013 and 2016, Julie spearheaded the process of acquiring and renovating this new facility for Counterpulse, helping to launch a new model for placing arts at the center of community development as the pilot project of the Community Art Stabilization Trust, which is also known as CAST. Under her leadership, Counterpulse is on track to purchase this building, as Ambrose said, in July of this year after raising more than $7 million. Wow. And without further ado, allow me to introduce our special guest, Gary Camilla. Gary is an author, journalist, and historian of San Francisco. His new book with artist Paul Madonna, who's in the house tonight, Yay! Woo! Yay! is Spirits of San Francisco, Voyages Through the Unknown. He is also the author of Cool Gray City of Love, 49 Views of San Francisco, which won a 2013 Northern California Book Award. His award-winning history column, Portals of the Past, appears every other Saturday in the San Francisco Chronicle. Born in Oakland, Gary grew up in Berkeley and has lived in San Francisco since 1971. He was a co-founder and longtime executive editor of the groundbreaking website Salon.com. Until 2018, he was the executive editor of San Francisco Magazine, where he wrote award-winning features about the tech-driven transformation of San Francisco, homelessness, the tenderloin, and legalized marijuana, among other subjects. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Book Review, Art Forum, Sports Illustrated, Mo Mother Jones, I almost said Monster Jones, <laughs> Mother Jones, and many other publications. He has also appeared in numerous documentaries, most recently, Moving San Francisco, which is all about transportation in San Francisco. Gary, you wrote that the Tenderloin is the creepy Mr. Hyde, which happens to be a street running through it, to the rest of San Francisco's respectable Dr. Jekyll. Tonight, we are going to explore this duality and how it might be an essential ingredient to what makes the city so special. As I said to many of you in my invite, my most fervent wish for tonight is for all of us to take a little break from feeling bummed out about the many challenges our city face is facing and instead get a dose of love in the form of a thread that weaves the good, the bad, and the ugly into something more productive and inspiring. Are we ready to try a little tenderness for the tenderloin? Yeah. Okay, no pressure. Take your time. That was amazing. I feel like, you know, a real TV producer tonight. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Gary. It's nice to see you again. Oh, it's great to be here. Nice to see you too, Julie. Yeah, we just got drinks on Monday night, and that's where the real dishing was happening. But we're, we're, we've packaged it all up for you, and we're excited to share some stories. So I just want to just dump, jump right into the deep end, hmm. pierce into the heart, and say that a big part of your book, Cool Gray City of Love, is about revealing the kind of unknown aspects of San Francisco, and it seems like you've made a personal passion of that investigation. So what would you say is something that most people don't know about the Tenderloin, but that you want people to know? Mm. Well, there's so many things about this most extraordinary neighborhood in San Francisco 
and many of them I learned from this extraordinary book, um, which is called The Tenderloin District of San Francisco Through Time by an author named Peter Field. Um, this is not only by far uh, the best book ever written on the Tenderloin, it's one of the best books ever written on any neighborhood in San Francisco. Uh, Peter's uh, research is just voluminous. Uh, when you do one of his walking tours, which I did with him before I wrote Cool Gray City, uh, it took us six hours to go, like, you know, a few blocks. <laughs> and he knows almost every building. And he, uh, he can tell you, you know, every, it's like, this neighborhood is, is like a geological strata. Uh, that it's it's the and the folds the uh, what's what's one of the mysterious and wonderful things about the tenderloin is that one particular part of its history is still so visible in a way that is true in very few other neighborhoods uh, not just here but anywhere in the country and that's this this sort of the this remarkably long era between the earthquake and say the post and post-World War II, and, and then the buildings still stand, but then there was a pretty dramatic shift. But this is for 40 years, 50 years, the Tenderloin was where the working people of San Francisco lived. Um, the Tenderloin and the adjoining, what's now called the Lower Knob Hill Historic Hotel and Apartment District, which is, you know, Geary, Post, Sutter, Bush, Pine, everything short of California Street. Um, there's uh, one, over 100 SROs in the Tenderloin, single uh, room occupancy hotels. And the, this is where the, the sinew of, of this city lived, the stenographers, the policemen, the barbers, some longshoremen, just working people lived in these cheap but decent, at that time, hotels. And they have all been preserved, right down to their blade signs. Um, so that's an extraordinary an aspect of it, but the history uh, g begins, and you know, some uh, the, the woman, uh, the development director, called out the Alamu. Actually, the Alamu probably had the good sense not to spend much time in this neighborhood. One of the great things about the Temple One is it's kind of a blank spot on the map of San Francisco for most of its uh, long, long history. It's a, it was a place called St. Anne's Valley. Um, this very, as hard as it is to imagine, it was remote even in the beginning of the gold rush because there were all these sand dunes on Market Street. Mm -hmm. And it actually, as a result of that, this was kind of a weird upscale suburb. That's one of the weirdest facts about the Tenderloin is that people fled downtown San Francisco, which was centered on Montgomery Street, and they moved through the, the sand dunes beyond Union Square, which was nothing at that time, to around Eddy and Powell and that area, which was this kind of declivity. There was a low pond there. And very wealthy men, including the Bonanza Kings, built their mansions in this neighborhood. Um, I, until I you know, read Peter's book, I had no idea that there was this you know, the very first iteration of the Tenderloin was this wealthy kind of suburb, and in a certain way, it was the first streetcar suburb. It was too close to really be a streetcar suburb because most people probably walked to work, but it was the opening up of Market Street with the Market Street Railway that led the development of this area and caused it to be very middle class. It was all single family homes, also hard to imagine. There were none of these apartment buildings. And then it has this long, complicated history, and the and the sort of the highlight of it, um, and this is one that we now have to kind of imagine, is when it becomes what Field dryly but very accurately calls San Francisco's premier hotel, theater, and vice district, <laughs> and, and with equal weight on each of those sort of neutral terms, and uh, and that's what I think that's what makes the Tenderloin, gives it this enduring kind of romantic appeal, was that you know, it starts out as this very wealthy enclave, and then basically this kind of lucky Baldwin builds this enormous theater right where the Bank of America building is at the corner of Powell and Market and Eddy, and there's all these theaters that start going in, and that actually ends up driving the rich people away, 
it become, and more hotels go in, so it becomes much more urban, the single family residences start moving to the western part of the Tenderloin, and then you start getting vice, you get hotels, you get the first uh, brothels, you get um, gambling, and you start to get crime, but it's, it's, quite, it's relatively genteel, it's not the Barbary Coast. Um, it's, a, it's a place where the men of, uh, that belong to the Elks Club and, and the Odd Fellows and these fraternal organizations have their smokers and their parties here. And the newspapers of the time are filled with ads from men going, I lost my diamond stick pin. And what they don't say is they lost their diamond stick pin in a parlor house, which was a genteel expression for a upscale brothel, which first began to appear in the Tenderloin in the 1870s. So it has this long run of being a vice district, but a really interesting mixed one, and a theater district where you, there's a little something for everyone. And that's one of the things that's sort of nice about many, one of the many wonderful things about being in an arts, culture, theater space right here, right now, is that the, the Tenderloin always was the neighborhood in San Francisco where there was something for everyone in, in theaters. You could go to legitimate opera, you could go to like really raunchy, melodian style entertainment like you'd almost find in the Barbary Coast and everything in between and, and you know, Shakespeare and, and doggerel plays and you know, just and the whole gamut of, of theater and performances. So, um, so all of that history um, by this kind of weird alchemy of the fact that the Tenderloin precisely in some ways because it's so challenged and it has it's so run down, it's so sort of ignored and forlorn, and it, it, some aspect of that actually keeps this feeling alive. And I'm not saying, you know, I, I don't want that to come across like let them eat cake, like, oh yes, I'm so glad those people are passed out from fentanyl, so it, 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 it adds to my aesthetic enjoyment of the past. But <laughs> there is this weird quality where, you know, if this was just a gentrified, normal neighborhood, it would be harder to uh, sort of visualize and connect with its really complicated past. So um, yeah, so those are some of the things, and there's just all kinds of things that that pop up that you'll see as you walk around when you know what they are. That are these incredible just time machines back into various periods of history of the Tenderloin, and we can talk about those <laughs> later. But uh, yeah, it's it's a it's the richest neighborhood in terms of its historical evocativeness. Um, I mean, Chinatown's up there pretty high too, but this is um, I think this is even even more extraordinary. Yeah, I sometimes feel like I'm walking around what would be the gothic quarter of San Francisco when I'm here, and the way the neighborhood feels old, like unchanged. Right. And it's, it is really incredible, and it's, 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 it seduces me. I know some people you know, have different feelings about spending time in the Tenderloin, but... Um, and this building has its own kind of storied past, actually, and I've heard some incredible stories about this building from many different people, and they kind of emerge... Um, over time, actually, because this used to be, uh, it was built in a cabaret, as a cabaret in the early 1900s, and it was called the Gaiety, and the Historic Blade sign is still out there and has been re-lettered now three times, so one of them is Counterpulse. Um, but I'm wondering if you have any particular stories, so in your book you talk about coming to the Tenderloin for the first time when you were 17, so um, that was much, much, much earlier than I ever first right. came to the Tenderloin, so I'm curious to know if you have any particular stories of this building, or this block, I mean, this block is yeah. its own kind of historic record. Yeah, no, oh, so many stories. Um, uh, Dale Seymour, who's a gentleman that, you know, was a former addict and drug slinger and then cleaned up his act and, you know, leads. Runs Code Tenderloin now. Right, all oh, right, and leads, still, I think, he leads yeah. walking mm -hmm. tours. Um, but, you know, he called the corner of Turk and Taylor, which we're about 40 feet away from, Tenderloin Ground Zero, mm -hmm. and it really is. Um, yeah, it's not, maybe now, you know, the sort of street scene doesn't support it quite as much as certain other corners in the Tenderloin, but it always did before. Um, it was, and part of that was on the corner was one of the greatest bars in the history of the universe. This is a true tragic loss for San Francisco, the 21 Club. 
Um, uh, don't take my word for it. Weirdly, it was proclaimed as such by none other than Esquire magazine. Oh, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, they must have, you know, the reporter must have really had a good time, the 21 year old. I mean, it was hard not to. I, I know. spent a lot of time there when I first started right. coming around the Tenderloin. Yeah, that, the, when the, ten, the 21 Club went down, what, five years ago, three years ago, something, you know. More like five, five. I think, yeah. That, that was a bitter pill. I, yeah. I felt like that, that was something like, eh, you know. Uh, Herb Cain um, famously, my friend was just reminding me of this great line that I'd forgotten that Herb Cain said, every city needs its tenderloins and you know every city needed its 21 club which was a kind of an oasis of moth-eaten camaraderie in this weird <laughs> corner and you'd go in there and you know i described them it's like you were the, the clientele felt like a bunch of old stuffed animals you know all well loved and really everything their, their their arms were falling off but they were it was such a great vibe in there and this great bartender frankie this filipino dude who was like awesome and that was a that was a great so that anchored the corner of turk and taylor um, it was a notoriously intense block. Um, you know, there was a big to-do in the city because all, a bunch of people noticed, and it was hard not to notice, that uh, during the worst of the crack uh, times in the 80s and l later, for many, 30, 40 years later, um, in fact, I think most of the use, the crack use was later than the 80s, um, this, what they call the uniblock, this sort of, the, the, the first block of Turk was a big crack smoking uh, place. And so there, the city did this big thing where they were like, we can't do this because tourists are coming here and people are openly smoking crack and it doesn't look good and um, we're gonna like remove all the parked cars so that the police can have a line of sight it was almost like a, it was like houseman in Paris, you know. We've got to have a clear line of sight to fire the cannons. Not that they were firing cannons, but the uh, so they could see and you know and get rid of the people. So you know, kind of a laudable goal, I suppose, in some ways. Um, I don't think it really worked. Um, I think they, you know, they'd worked for a while and then it then it didn't work. Um, but the uh, yeah, the block. This was a very a very. Uh, it had a middle of everything. It had the greatest bookstore in San Francisco, McDonald's Books, which was, I don't know if any of you ever went to McDonald's Books. On, it was uh, in the same, I think it was only about three doors down from, from where we are now. And you'd go in, you'd go down into the basement, and it was actually dangerous. Um, there, there were, the books were just stacked on top of each other, about 15 feet high. And if there had been any kind of temblor, anyone down there would have been crushed by completely unorganized, well, not completely, but mostly unorganized volumes. So that was an amazing place. That's some people's idea of an honorable death, though. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I know. That would be a good way to go. But my, ones, my personal story about this corner was, I write about it in Cool Gray City, I, when I was a taxi driver, as I did for seven years, I picked up a couple of dudes that I shouldn't have picked up in front of the old air porter, which was, uh, which actually was one of the things uh, that uh, it was where the da where the airports uh, buses stopped in downtown San Francisco. And they stopped at Taylor, I guess between Eddie and Ellis, I think, or maybe Ellis and O'Farrell, on the west side of the street, and um, I picked up these two dudes that I should never have picked up, and they said they wanted to go to the airport, even though they had no luggage. And I like, and then one of them got in the front seat, and then one got in the back seat. These are a whole bunch of red flags. But I was kind of inexperienced, and I was having a bad night. And then my night got a lot worse because then one of them st stuck a gun against my head, and they eventually made me drive around and made me drove me into the Hills of Eternity Cemetery in Colma, which was really scary. Like you know, this just seemed like a good place to be like offed. Um, but they threw me out of the car. I ran off screaming, "Help!" They drove away. They found the cab the next day at the base of Petrero Hill. But then, where this counterpulse site comes in, is like only a few weeks later, I was driving again, driving through the Tenderloin, which is not, not learning too well. Although, actually, you know, it was fine to pick up on the Tenderloin. You just had to have street smarts. But these two dudes were standing right in front of the dollhouse, where we are right now, the porno arcade, or, you know, and the, uh, 
they, they were extremely like dubious looking guys and obviously the fact that they were either coming out of the dollhouse or this is where they were hanging out did not inspire confidence but I nonetheless let them get into the cab but I was so traumatized by my earlier robbery that I drove about three blocks and then I suddenly stopped the car got out and said I'm sorry I don't want to do this this cab ride and they but the funny thing was they didn't protest that much <laughs> they weren't that outraged they were like oh okay and they got out. So uh, that was my, my one distinct memory of the dollhouse. And the other thing that I just would point out that when it was the gaiety, it opened, according to Field, it opened as the gaiety in 1963, which makes it one of the earliest of the kind of porno places. But apparently it was spelled initially with a Y, and then it went along for 15 years, and in 1978, when San Francisco had become quite gay, they went, hmm, we don't want people to think this is like one of them gay joints. So they changed it to the G-A-I-E-T-Y. Yeah, <laughs> and, then it became, and then it became the dollhouse after that. And then, it, you know, then the dollhouse had the end of its run. But yeah, this corner was, uh, this, this, this block in the Tenderloin was really, um, you know, the, the radioactive heart of the Tenderloin. Mm -hmm. There was, you'd, and you know, there's the private jail on the other side of the street mm -hmm. where the uh, state con subcontracts out to people on parole, awaiting trial, waiting to finish their parole. Um, that gray, ugly building on the uh, northwest corner. Yes, and, uh, there. Right, and Old so Hopkins. that that yeah. uh, that adds a special, you know, little extra mix to the population on the, in the street. Yeah. Yeah, one of my favorite um, anecdotes about this building is that it was one of its point of uh, points of fame was that it was the oldest standing straight porn <laughs> cinema no, in San Francisco, and like only in San Francisco <laughs> is that even. <laughs> you know, like, but that's notable. That's the marked yeah. category, actually. That's something to pump out your chest with sick pride. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, that's that's an interesting, <coughs> an interesting look into a place that's very familiar and layered for me personally. Mm. I actually lived here on this block for a number of years myself, so it's mm. many things to me, and it's, it's it actually has changed a lot in mm. the last seven years. Maybe, mm. according to Frankie, anyways, mm. the the owner of the Twenty One Club, like we were talking about, it's changed more in the last like ten years than it's ever changed in his whole experience of the neighborhood. So. Mm. I'm not sure what that means, but I think it, it, it points to just some of the breakneck speeds that San Francisco in general has been changing, but also obviously this huge development that's gone up across the street here. And right. yeah, so the stories keep amounting, like, and keep layering and, and rolling on. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I want to I wanna get your opinion on why it is these stories kind of layer into the Tenderloin in quite the way it does, why it seems to be such an exceptional mm. neighborhood in the city. Like, we all, you know, as you mentioned, mm. and, and I'm certainly well aware, is that the most consolidated holding of affordable mm. and protected housing in the country is right. actually here in the Tenderloin, right. and that's one of the reasons that it's resisted gentrification, and right. as we've seen so many other neighborhoods fall, to, fall prey to that. Right. But beyond that kind of that kind of told mm -hmm. story. Yeah. I'm wondering if you have any feelings on what else has contributed to the Tenderloin kind of remaining the neighborhood, neighborhood that it has with the challenges, but also the mm -hmm. kind of amazing freedom to be and cultural expression that, that exists just here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it mostly is, I think, Julie, those structural reasons. Um, I think that if you didn't have um, nonprofits um, owning and controlling real estate, in a very powerful way with the political backing of the city. Yeah, like TNDC. And TNDC, THC, yeah. Mercy Housing, you know, there's a long list of really great... Uh, Counterpulse is adding ourselves to that list. Right, yeah, yeah. that's right. And the great charities, you know, St. Anthony's, Glide, uh, Larkin Street Youth Services, um, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, hospitality House. You know, well, maybe a better question is right. why are all of those nonprofits right. consolidated here? Well, I think that, you know, essentially they follow the, the, uh, a, need, a needy population. I mean, I think that this, uh, the Tenderloin historically, for a whole bunch of deep structural reasons and some specific reasons, began a quite a precipitous decline 
uh, after World War II. Some of it was GIs not coming here, the closing of the shipyards, big structural changes in the U.S. economy where blue-collar work uh, went out and San Francisco became much more of a corporate employed city. Um, and then inflation in the 70s, and then urban renewal, quote unquote, which James Baldwin famously called Negro removal, which devastated a lot of uh, lower, you know, working class and lower class areas where people were marginally employed or unemployed, and suddenly they had nowhere to go because after urban renewal, those uh, housing units were never replaced uh, for them, and so the, a lot of them ended up here. And then you have the, then the homelessness epidemic of the, the U.S., which begins in the 1980s, the deinstitutionalization of the mentally ill, a lot of people being released from jail. Um, you've got this kind of perfect storm, and a lot of it is sort of the, the dark side of American capitalism, and it starts from the top. There was Jimmy Carter, sad to say, was actually preceded Reagan in cutting um, federal housing. So you can't put it all on Reagan. Carter actually did it before Reagan. And um, so all of these things play into uh, the Tenderloin becoming this very, very poor, very challenged place where um, a very significant number of the people living here are what are called quadruple diagnosed. They, yeah, they may to a middle class eye look ominous because they're hanging out and like, getting high and doing this well, and that. Well, we all just hang out in our living exactly. rooms. Exactly. So <laughs> yeah, we, we would look ominous if I would look ominous if I had to do all Dolores that on the Park in Washington Square. <laughs> you know, they do it at Turk and Taylor, because there isn't any Washington Square. Um, you know, but not to minimize, there is obviously a lot of challenges in, in a lot of folks that live here. So yeah, so you've got this population that just has a lot of challenges, and you know, some don't, but a lot do. And going back to your question, I mean, I think that's why uh, these nonprofits and the city and you know Glide um, and all of these uh, you know the first soup kitchen I think opened here in 1950 so this is responding that's when you know it's the depression was a whole nother th factor in the decline of the tenderloin mm -hmm. deferred maintenance the building started right. to go down there's all this stuff so uh, yeah I think they end up here uh, to serve this population and then what happens is you get the critics of it go, well, this is like a containment zone, which de facto it kind of is, because yeah. no other neighborhood is going to allow this to happen. You know, the, the, the city keeps trying to do it. We're going to create, you know, little mini tenderloins elsewhere, and those other neighbors are like, no, we don't want it. You know, so it's kind of, it's, it's sort of locked in here. And, you know, there's some downsides to that. Uh, I've interviewed a artist, an African-American artist who passed away, sadly, uh, uh, Ronnie Goodman, and he told me, man, I can't live in the Tenderloin. You know, like, I'm, I'm trying to clean up, you know, and I, I, I walk out of my apartment and some dude sell me some shit, you know, and I, I can't deal with it, you know, I can't clean up living here. So that's a legitimate concern, you know, um, but, you know, that, I mean, there's no, there are no easy answers to these conundrums. There's no, you know, yes, we could like impose draconian uh, measures and just gentrify the whole area. We couldn't, but if by in some counterfactual universe, we could, but that would be monstrous. You know, I mean, essentially, you'd be just taking this whole population and moving them somewhere else and then either making it somebody else's problem or creating some kind of uh, mini tenderloin in another area. I mean, it's, it's not... It, it, it's not really a viable option. And, uh, but to let things just, con con without any uh, intervention, uh, there's a lot of real suffering and, and pain of, 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 yeah, if somebody's quadruple diagnosed, and as you know, um, you know somebody told me, that it was, uh, oh yeah, the, uh, the guy that, that does the Tenderloin tours. He goes, hey, if you're like, you know, I, I'm totally cool with people hanging out, but it says if you're pissing and shitting on yourself and pimping out women and, and you know, selling drugs, you got to go. Now, the problem is, so in a way, and this is the guy with the street cred to say that, but the problem is, that's not so easy to do either, because it's not, how do you, there's, it's, not, it's not like there's a bright line where here's the evil drug dealer, 
And there's the kind of okay user, it might, he might even settle a little sometimes, like it's hard, it's, it's really hard for the cops, and I've talked to cops about this, to distinguish between you know the guys that everyone knows are bad and the ones that are just kind of messed up, but they're not that bad. Well, they're and, just like you know, low-wage laborers. Like, they're just right. clocking in in the way that I'm coming to work in the morning. Right. Yeah, I think you told me when we were talking the other day that you, you do a great, Counterpost does this great thing where you have, is it a weekly, you know, where you open the doors to the community to do arts, art. Activity, arts, activity, yeah. Arts, and there's this one guy that you know is like a heroin dealer. It's <laughs> like cross-stitching yeah, on every other like, Friday with counterpost. <laughs> and to me, that almost like sort of, that, maybe that's kind of getting ahead of our conversation, but in some ways things like that are, you know, you take these little kind of victories and, and uh, you know, the, that, that's a good, that's, you know, it's nice that he's doing that. I'm not, you know, obviously there's a bigger conversation about what do we do about people selling drugs in the Tenderloin. That's a really difficult problem. So, it is a difficult but, problem, and it's, it's systematic like so many things, so right. it's, not, it's not straightforward. Right. Um, but, you know, I think, I don't know, just reflecting on what you're saying, one of the things that I find most inspiring about living and working mm. in the Tenderloin is that it creates a baseline where the most important thing to do is to be really human. Right. Mm. And when I first started coming to this block, the block was much, much rougher. And it was also, I learned over time in a few really unfortunate mistakes that it was really run by this, this group of women that I, I couldn't identify actually at mm. first. And that the the block was run by these yeah, women. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, and and that and that in a way it's it's challenging and it's hard, but there's also an opportunity in something quite grounding, especially existing in San Francisco, which feels very abstracted and capitalistic and materialistic, to just be like in the tenderloin. The most important thing to do is be human with people, right? And that will get you far. Yeah, and, and just like grounds you and roots you and like. One of the things that I would say is most mysterious about the Tenderloin is just how connected it is as right. a community mm. and how it's the most non-anonymous neighborhood mm. I've ever operated in in, the, in San Francisco. Like, I, I lived my first five or six years in San Francisco in the Castro, mm. and I never knew the names of my neighbors, mm. you know? Like, and, and that's not true in the Tenderloin. You need each other, you need each other. I know, I know the names of my neighbors, I know the names of the executive directors who run organizations around me, I know the names of all the drug dealers and the ones who belong and the ones who right. are like, who are you, right. you know? Like, right. um, and that, that like basis in humanity, at least for my disposition, is actually um, nourishing even yeah. if it's challenging. Yeah. Like it's also equally challenging to be sane in an insane world. Right. And so right. sometimes the Tenderloin feels more, more grounded in the fact that it's insane, but it's because the world right. is spinning out of control. Right. That's why, right. and then it's like, it's sort of like actually a really reasonable response right. to be insane. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. No, and I, I really share, I think anybody who spent much time here and I can't pretend to have any great knowledge of the Tenderloin, but yeah, you know, some experiences like yeah, being you know a bunch of times in the Twenty One Club, talking to people on the street sometimes, done some interviews with homeless people where I just come up to people on the street and they're talking to them, and so it might not even be in the Tenderloin, but it's a very similar population. And um, yeah, I mean, what, when you're talking about that, the kind of openness, the humility, yeah, there is a tenderness. There's a there's kind of a vulnerability, and it's, you know, it's, it's sort of primitive Christianity, you know, it's what Jesus Christ uh, ministered to, um, you know, it's like the least among you, and there's a, when you get really ground down by life, as a lot of these uh, folks that live here have been, um, there's some really uh, powerful things that can come out of that, I mean, obviously there's a lot of problems that come out of it, but there is, there's this sense of, you know, you'll see these two, I just walked on, walked over here today from where I live in North Beach, and as I was walking down Mason Street, I, there's these two really bedraggled guys, one black guy, one white guy, and they're like, you know, got all this stuff spread out all over the sidewalk. Um, but they're like this kind of little team, you know, they're like these buddies, like doing their thing. And there's a million things like that that you will see 
And I'm obviously I'm not saying that we all want to go out and embrace this lifestyle and you know have our Charles Bukowski moment, but it's um, but it, there is something that's uh, that's touching and human, as you say, um, about a lot of the interactions and the people in this neighborhood. And I think you know um, people notice it. I think that spend time here, and it's it's something that's. Um, and yeah, it's that's one thing that I think a lot of middle class people that come into this neighborhood, um, they you know if if you don't stop and engage or kind of you know open yourself up to what is going on, but you just have this cliched look of like oh, it was dangerous and there's crime here, you won't see that. And frankly, the Obviously, there is crime and there is danger here, but I always feel when I'm walking through the Tenderloin that the biggest danger is that somebody's going to fall on me. You know, it's, yeah. like, it's not that they're going to rob me. Not, you know? not a lot of petty crime going no, on. No, it's just that there's a lot of people that are really <laughs> fucked up. So yeah. they like collapse on you, but you know, yeah. I can get out of the way of that. Yeah, no, right. it's true. It's like really simply put, but actually, right. it's just really true. Right. Um, well, you know, I wanna I wanna turn the conversation a little bit to the role of art mm. in, in neighborhoods like the Tenderloin, right. because obviously it's a point of interest for me right. trying to do the work that we're doing here at Counterpulse. And you know, in my research and in my conversations with Del Seymour, I have found that mm. the arts actually have played a really significant role in the Tenderloin throughout the years, and mm. that Counterpulse is kind of adding itself or standing on the shoulders of that legacy. But outside of a kind of historical mm -hmm. context, more kind of a philosophical yeah. question, what role do you think the arts could have in, in preserving the kind of character of the Tenderloin mm -hmm. and therefore the city, but also what role do you think we should be playing mm -hmm. in the kind of future of the neighborhood and city? Yeah. Um, well, big question. I mean, I just, I obviously, I'm a huge believer in art for art's sake, uh, to sound like Oscar Wilde and a 19th century SV, but I, I think art is a wonderful phenomenon that we need more of. Um, it's challenging in San Francisco. It's an old, tired story about how artists can't afford to live here, but it's nonetheless true. Um, but I think that in the Tenderloin in particular, there's a bunch of things. I mean, one of them is what we just sort of alluded to. Um, if folks come down to a place like Counterpost that's located in what used to be like the worst corner in San Francisco, it's not now, uh, there's worse corners in the Tenderloin, but it's still a place that a lot of people that would go to the ballet or the opera would be a little like weaked out about coming. Um, but so just the, the level of knowledge and connection of going into this neighborhood and seeing it is a good thing in itself. Um, and then obviously, yeah, I mean, artistic programming, eclectic, cutting edge, interesting programming, I think is, th is been shown, I mean, this is kind of like a, it's almost sociological thing, but yeah, insofar as you could get folks that are facing a lot of challenges in their lives, um, be, being drawn into a creative process or, or watching people doing it is a really positive thing. And then the fact it's the nature of people that do arts organizations. It's like it's like Dale Seymour said, like the people that come to the Tenderloin know they respect the Tenderloin lifestyle. You know, it's like it's the, the people that come and people like yourself and other people that have opened up other artistic endeavors in the last decade, piano fight and you know exit theater and there's a, a bunch of, of places. You know, they're respectful of the scene they're in and they add. And so they add a, a, a mosaic, they add, you know, a, a, an element to the neighborhood that's rich. And that art is, I like to think of arts organizations, they're kind of like, they're like a wild card in terms of these sort of cliché of gentrification. And gentrification is a, actually a word that needs to be unpacked and stop being used as this term of opprobrium and abuse. It's a very complicated phenomenon. There's good aspects of gentrification too. But arts organizations, uh, I think, are, you know, they're often not big money, they're not big driven by, you know, making a lot of money. They have really enlightened people that might relate well to the neighborhood. <laughs> Hopefully you might bring some people in the neighborhood in. I know that's obviously a challenge. 
Um, but you know, it's a it's basically a good thing, and it doesn't just have to be the classic New York model where we'll send in the artists first as our shot troops, and then five years later we'll bring in the big real estate developers and clear everybody out. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, the, what what the alternative is beyond that, it's really really tricky. Um, and I don't pretend that there's some magic formula that I would have to, you know, how arts organizations are going to transform this neighborhood, because they're really not. I mean, uh, but they, to me, I sort of look forward about the Tenderloin and what, you know, arts and uh, what, what could be done here in general to improve it. I feel like it's like, it's block. It's block to block. It's it's part. It's part of a block to part of a block. Mm -hmm. It's small victories. It's adding, uh, trying to add positive things, without uh, too much displacement. Um, you know, there may be some displacement sometimes. Sometimes displacement. There's been studies that show displacement is not always negative. Sometimes people get displaced up. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, it's uh, it's a very you know yeah. When a neighborhood improves. We want there to be retail. We want there to be good grocery stores. And you know, there's a lot of things that quote unquote gentrification could bring into the neighborhood that would be positive for everyone living here. And you know, the trick is how do you do that without massive uh, displacement and without you know r lo losing the unique qualities of the tenderloin while also trying to uh, cut back on the egregious problems. That particular equation, um, you know, if I had the answer to that, I'd have a Nobel Prize. Yeah. <laughs> no, nobody really nobody knows how to do that. And I don't think there is a, you know, like I said before, yeah, we could go in with kind of a blowtorch, um, but that's not going to happen. And uh, But then just letting things go exactly as they are is not, I don't think is a humane and legitimate option either. I mean, yeah. so, you know, I think that, you know, uh, some of, like, uh, Governor Newsom has an idea that I think actually might be uh, fruitful, um, this care courts, and some of it m would involve um, changing involuntary like commitment. Well, it's a, it's a board, it's psychiatric, basically. Right. It's basically, it's, a, it's uh, you know, it'll be controversial because it runs into civil liberties, uh, runs right. afoul of the hardline civil liberties um, thing about commitment. But, you know, there's an argument on both sides, obviously, because the argument on the other side is you're, all, you're talking about preserve, protecting the civil liberties of people that are really in, in misery and squalor. Right. And, uh, and it's not just about, oh, I want to get rid of them because I want the middle class people not to have to see them. It's about helping yeah. people that really need help, and they're not getting help. So, so that's something to think about as well, you know, in terms of this of going going forward. Yeah, well, you've really beautifully answered actually my last question to those of us who love and work and live and visit the Tenderloin frequently. I think do have hopes for change, and we've just become very, very dubious of change because change often means gentrification in ways that aren't helpful. Right. So, it's. I, I, I thank you for offering these insights into how change, even if it's dubbed gentrification or uh, otherwise, can actually be a dream for the Tenderloin because it's it's a little bit callous to hear people who want the Tenderloin to stay the same. When you're living here or working here, right. you want changes. And good grocery stores is like right. a poetic way of framing right. that whole thing. Right. So, right. Um, I actually just want to go into a lightning round. We're just going to wrap up and then we hope to hear some questions from you. But because the neighborhood is so rich and there's so many things that you can do to eat here, to go to shows, let's just get Gary's opinion on a few things. So um, what is your favorite place to get a drink in the Tenderloin now that the 21 Club is closed? Uh, well, it would have to be the wonderfully named Joan L. <laughs> I, I love bars that are named after the intersections they're on. So this bar. What, I actually what, haven't heard of Joan what, Ellis what, what before. What Jones and Ellis? <laughs> right. You got to You got to <laughs> You got to go into the western. You got to get out of the out of the the, 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 the ground zero. Yeah. Uh, no, that's that's kind of a that's kind of a cool bar. Joan Ellis. Okay. Joan yeah. Ells. I'm literally yeah. gonna write that down because yeah. I'm always looking for a new place. And what about where you like to get a bite to eat? Um, boy, uh, there's a, 
of the, the whole little Saigon area has a lot of great places. I almost feel like I shouldn't reveal this because it's like the best, cheapest sandwich in brunch, San Francisco. Brunch lines. But there's this little this place called Little Saigon, Saigon which, is on, which is on Larkin. I love that and place. I'm, I'm not kidding. You get a really large, excellent Vietnamese sandwich with two kinds of pork, and then it's got the cilantro and the carrots, the vinaigrette, the great French roll. Like it's really big. It's it like is. a big, huge sandwich. It I costs second this. Four seventy-five. Yeah, it's really <laughs> it's like, cheap. It's and really, then really Yemen good. Kitchen would be my my answer to that question. Oh, yeah, you said that. The I, other day, and we I can walked, go together I walked sometime. By. Yeah, yeah, let's do that sometime. It's disguised um, elegant, elegantly with a Brooklyn Pizza sign, so it also makes you feel like you've discovered something that's <laughs> arriving there. Um, what's your favorite landmark building in the neighborhood? Ooh, um, well, I th there. I love, there's a bunch of them actually. There this, are. this is one of these strange historical things that is actually another part of the rich artistic history of the Tenderloin are all these buildings that were called film exchanges. So the Tenderloin was the, the center of San Francisco's physical film industry. When all the big movie palaces were on Market Street, Right. Film was extremely the great dangerous. White mile, is that what right, the great, it, right? yeah, exactly, the Great White Way or whatever the right. mile, and and film before they got safety acetate, um, it was like made with nitrate or something, and it was very flammable. Yeah, it could like Total blow liability. up a whole building. Yeah, so they built these really fortress-like, you know, concrete buildings to hold the films, mm -hmm. and they and then then they they most of those buildings, I think almost all of them still stand, and then there's a whole bunch that are on the Hyde Street uh, as you go down from Turk, between Turk and uh, I guess it's um, uh, McAllister, or Golden Gate, Turk mm -hmm. and Golden Gate. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then, then there's like some big recording studios were in that area too. Mm -hmm. But And then my, to me, I, just because I'm a huge jazz fan, um, there, this doesn't exist, but it's a vacant lot, but it's a very evocative vacant lot on that same corner. It's on the um, uh, the northeast corner of Turk and Hyde was where this amazing uh, jazz club called the Blackhawk stood, and the Blackhawk actually also broke the color line, um, you know, because of they had black jazz musicians playing there when they weren't supposed to be playing downtown. Miles Davis recorded two albums there. And, uh, and it was right next to a bar where I used to pick up and I was a taxi driver. A gay, a gay bar called The Trip. But, and the, the dispatcher would always refer to it as Triple Deuce Hyde. <laughs> the, triple Deuce. Triple Deuce, which is cool. Actually, right. the mayor's chief of staff, Sean Ellsburn's grandfather, owned that club. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, there's, there's some, must be some stories there. <laughs> <laughs> You're here for the tidbits, folks. Um, well, thank you so much for all the storytelling tonight, Gary. It's oh. been really interesting to hear. I want to just ask if there's anybody in the audience who has any questions for Gary um, in this kind of lightning round fashion, just little tidbits or even anything a little bit more in depth. Um, we did start a little bit late. It's a little after eight, but I'm going to just take about five more minutes for audience questions. So you're not getting locked into anything too serious. So <laughs> feel free to ask a question if you've got one. Yeah, here. What happened to the 21? Well, I, you, you know I better. You talked to Frankie yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you take yeah, that? Yeah, well, one? no, it's actually right. a good story because while it's a huge loss for the neighborhood, Frankie actually just sold the bar and retired. Okay. <laughs> so not displaced. Um, and since then, um, so he actually bought some property in Marin County and it's still, <laughs> in, the, still in the vicinity. So yeah, Frankie, Frankie has a success story. Um, and they've tried to open a number of things in that bar, all I think a little too fancy for the britches. I don't know if that's a turn of phrase, but it, it right. definitely describes what's gone on there. Um, some like speakeasy things, and, and, and so it's mostly been boarded up since he left, honestly, with just sort of little stints of people experimenting with new types of bars there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a quick anecdote and then a question. Mm. I was a bike messenger in 1979, and I used to deliver, well, not used to, but three or four times, canisters of film from this porn 
obviously a uh, filmmaking play mm. on battery to the dollhouse. Oh, wow. <laughs> really? It was a great run for me because it weighed a lot. So it was my gravy train run. As we used to call it. Did you do it by weight? Is that how oh, my you got paid by work? weight? Yeah, well, that's part of it, as well as the length of the run. Oh. So I all the way down battery and cut up our Right, but you're like really heavy <laughs> downhill. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Because <laughs> they, don't, they don't pay you for grade, yeah. I bet. First couple of I didn't know what the hell it was. I figured out what I was doing. So, Gary, is there another place in the United States that had as many SROs in it as the Tenderloin? And do you think the SRO density has been a big part of why the Tenderloin has maintained its kind of demographic yeah. character? Yeah, the, I, I, there is not. I think definitively yeah. there's not. This, yeah. is, this is the most, um, according to Field, uh, who mm -hmm. is the, the god of all Tenderloin knowledge, there is... And I've never seen um, even the Lower Knob Hill historic hotel and apartment district. It's remarkable. This is a really little known thing, but there's apparently no neighborhoods with that many residential apartment buildings in a downtown area in the whole country. I mean, and when you go to New York, there's no part of New York where you see that many as you see on Bush and Pine and Sutter and Post. Um, and the Tenderloin, same with the SROs. And uh, yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, we didn't get into the nitty gritty of what uh, has led the Tenderloin to be the Tenderloin in terms of real estate structural things, but the fact that there were all those SROs and then that because of tenant activism and nonprofits and NGOs getting involved and changing the laws and making it illegal to convert the SROs because there were attempts to convert them into tourist hotels, which would have been you know, just accelerated the, the end of the Tenderloin as we know it. And so the, those, those SROs are kind of protected now. And there's also height limits in the Tenderloin. Yeah. So those two things, the height limits laws and the laws against conversion into uh, tourist hotels have really kept the Tenderloin as it is. So you're, you're absolutely right. Mm. Any other questions? Yeah. The Tenderloin has always been a place where I think people who were different felt accepted and also felt it was a liberated neighborhood. And I hope you can speak a little bit about the LGBT history. Mm. Oh, yeah. The queer and trans liberation in the neighborhood. In the yeah. History. Yeah, this was uh, San Francisco's first gay neighborhood long before that word was used. Um, and. Uh, you know, North Beach competed with it. North Beach began to, I just found out, because I was delighted to find out that the first lesbian bar in San Francisco, Mona's, opened at the end of my alley in North Beach, which is like up the hill a little bit. It's called Varen's, Varen's and Union. And in 1933, Mona's opened on that corner. Um, so, but the Tenderloin, yeah, they, there was, it was part of its, you know, sort of the sin district milieu. Um, there was that feeling of what, what happens in, in the Tenderloin stays in the Tenderloin. And uh, yeah, so there was, it was more, and obviously it went up and down. You know, there was uh, the whole, the city's attitude towards vice in general uh, and towards gay bars and lesbian bars. Uh, went up and down over the years, and depending, you know, there was a huge crackdown that started in the 50s when the um, the Hearst run Examiner, uh, you know, spearheaded this this big campaign. Says if we don't clear out all of these bars, this city will be nothing but deviates. Deviate was the favorite word, not deviant, but deviate. Like you've deviated from the straight line, and. Uh, and then they got into this whole thing with the Alcoholic Board of Control, and they used that. And there, and there was a, you know, uh, this whole weird time where there was a landmark court case, won by the owner of the Black Cat, which started out on the Tenderloin, but then moved to North Beach, where they, he won this landmark case that gay people were allowed to congregate publicly. However, the, the downside, that was a great victory. The downside was that as long as they not, did not engage in illegal or immoral activity, which meant like, you know, trying to pick somebody up or, you know, 
touching them in some way that was deemed inappropriate. So then the cops started to use that and there was a lot of entrapment and you know, a lot of places got busted. But yeah, the Tenderloin had a long, you know, long rich history um, of uh, LGBTQ you know, uh, community being here and uh, it's one of the kind of cool parts of its history. Yeah, and it's you know now recognized as the first um, trans cultural district in the nation related to the Compton's Cafeteria right. riots that happened again just 40 feet from here. Right. So right. transgendered, um, I guess mostly like hustlers and drag mm -hmm. queens and this kind yeah. of thing rose up and riot against mm. the police here in San Francisco, just, just literally right here on the corner in the facility that's now the private jail, actually. Right. Right. Um, which is one of the reasons why this neighborhood has been designated as a transcultural district. So there's been multiple kind of intersecting roles that this neighborhood has played in the LGBTQI right. community. Right. Yeah, thank you for your question. I'm gonna just close this out formally. Um, you don't have to go home. We'd love for you to stick around and have another drink and chat with us further, but we're gonna unhinge from this kind of mic'd and uh, audience format and it's been a real pleasure to share stories with you. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you've learned something new about this incredible neighborhood and thank you so much for coming to Counterpulse. Thank you, thank you all for coming.